Good morning, everyone. Russ Barkley here once again with our weekly ADHD research update. But as always, I've got another dad joke for you, so stay tuned. Why can't my bicycle stand up? Wait for it. Because it's too tired. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Oh my God, very clever, very clever. Okay, this week we've got uh, several studies that I want to talk about, at least four or five that were published that I think are significant, uh, at least worthy of comment in my opinion. So we'd best get started because some of these are going to be somewhat controversial issues. The first one I want to talk about is about ADHD and its relationship to preferences for sexual activities and gender preferences. Uh, and this is a survey that was just recently published in the journal Environmental Research and Public Health by a colleague, Susan Young. And it is based on an anonymous survey that was done using the survey mechanism known as SurveyMonkey. And it involved over 1,300 adults some of whom about, oh, let's see, I think it's 541 had adult ADHD uh, and the rest served as controls for that. And they gave these individuals a survey of a variety of sexual activities, sexual preferences to see what the differences are between ADHD adults and typical adults and also any differences that might be evident between men and women with ADHD. And, and what did they find? Uh, as it says here, the ADHD group had a significantly higher preference for same-sex or either sex partners. They had a higher rate of electronic sexual exchanges, I assume that's sexing, higher rates of masturbation, higher rates of sexually transmitted diseases. The latter, by the way, has been found repeatedly in other studies of sexual activity in adult ADHD, as you can see in my other video on that particular topic. They also found that adults with ADHD reported being more adventurous in their sexual interests and practices, but also being substantially less satisfied with their current sex partners, both sexually and in general. That also has been found previously where relationship satisfaction is usually typically rated as lower in pairs that have, where one at least has adult ADHD. They did find that in comparing the sexes within the ADHD group, that there were a number of findings with regard to females relative to males. For instance, females with adult ADHD had a younger onset of their sexual activities than males, were less likely to use contraception, had more sexual practices, and practiced infidelity more often than did males with ADHD. Uh, by the way, all of those were noted in prior studies about ADHD in adults, but had not identified the sex differences that I just noted there. They found that sexual interests differed between the sexes, but females more commonly acted on them compared to males who did not. The findings, they say, suggest both sexes with ADHD engage in a pattern of risky sexual behaviors, perhaps driven by their impulsivity, uh, but the risk is substantially greater in females. So now we have to understand this is an anonymous survey. Nobody went out to follow up to see whether these self-reports were true or not. I'm not sure how you could anyway, uh, but at least it gives us a glimpse into differences in sexual preferences and activities in adults with ADHD. So have a look at that if that topic interests you. Now, here's another article this week. We had one last week as well on this topic on the risk of cardiovascular diseases associated with the long-term use of ADHD medications. The one last week I talked about was a study in Israel about differences in dosage of ADHD drugs and risk for cardiovascular problems. Uh, but this one, now we look at duration. So here's a large-scale study that took place in Sweden uh, that involved people with ADHD between the ages of 6 and 64. And they looked at 
the rate of various cardiovascular diseases, those included ischemic heart disease, arterial disease, hypertension, heart failure, arrhythmias, uh, thromboembolic disease, that's sort of like blood clots and uh, stroke, and other forms of heart disease. So they're looking at a variety of heart-related problems in this study. Uh, overall, it's a very large study. They had 278,000 individuals with ADHD in this study. Now, something I need to point out, just a little over 10,000 of them were found to have had a cardiovascular event of some kind during the follow-up period with these individuals. Uh, so what does that mean? It means that less than 5% of the people in the ADHD group experienced any cardiovascular disease event. So that's a very low rate. We need to keep that in mind. 95% of the individuals in the study who were on medication did not experience any of these problems. But a little bit less than 5% did. Um, and they're now going to go on in the study and link this up with duration of taking ADHD medication. Noteworthy is they don't distinguish between stimulants and non-stimulants. Stimulants are known to have a slightly higher likelihood of affecting blood pressure uh, and also affecting heart rate to a small but significant degree compared to the non-stimulants. They just sort of put it all together and looked at it and they broke it down into people who use medicine for less than a year, for a year, for two years, for three years, and then for three to five years and then greater than five years. What they found is that over time, the longer an individual was on medication, the greater the likelihood they had one of two cardiovascular events, either hypertension, or arterial disease, which is like plaque in the arteries. Um, so those two, they did not find any greater likelihood of heart attack, uh, that is sudden death, of arrhythmias, of the uh, thrombocytic sort of heart disease. Uh, basically, it was these two, hypertension and increased arterial disease. Uh, and this grew at a rate of about 4% per year up to about three years of drug use and then leveled off after that. So in essence, those who had been on medication longer, three years or longer, were likely to have had more of these events. How much more? About a 4% increase in risk. So let's do the math here because I think while the conclusions sound very scary, they're really not. First of all, you're starting out with a rate of about, let's say 4% of these individuals had a cardiovascular event. Now, with each year they're on medication, that goes up another 4%. Not 4% total, 4% of the 4%. So about 1.5% increase in risk with each year on medication up to three years. So overall, by the time this study wraps up its follow-up period, we're seeing that anywhere from, say, 4 to 8% of people taking medication might have experienced one of those two cardiovascular events. But again, not sudden death, not heart attack, not arrhythmia, uh, and those kinds of things, the more serious things. But there was some risk of hypertension here. So a small but growing risk related to the medication use. I wish they had split it into stimulant, non-stimulant drugs. They did not. That would have been helpful. But here's something to keep in mind before we rush to judgment about medications increasing cardiovascular risk. And that is that this study did not control in any way for severity of ADHD. Why is that important? Because we know that the more severe your ADHD, the more likely you're going to be prone to various cardiovascular problems, and specifically hypertension, arterial disease, and so on, as I've talked about in my video on health outcomes. So ADHD is linked to these problems, and severity of ADHD is also linked. And it's very possible that more severe cases of ADHD take medication for longer periods of time than less severe cases. So it may not be the duration of medication use that's the issue here, but duration could simply be a marker for severity of your disorder.
So we can't rule that out here as an alternative explanation to these results. But the results do make some rational sense when we consider that certain ADHD drugs do increase heart rate, do increase blood pressure. Uh, and so it would not be surprising to see that with longer term use, there's a little bit of increase in risk of these events. But overall, the vast majority, over 90% of the individuals in the study with ADHD who were taking medication for various lengths of time had no risk for cardiovascular disease. So that's an important take home message here that kind of gets lost in these conclusions. By the way, there's a nice editorial by my friend Samuel Cortese that goes along with this article in that journal. And by the way, the journal was JAMA Clinical Re Reviews. Uh, and uh, it's worth having a look at the editorial as well because it also talks about the risk benefit of taking medication versus not taking medication. And we know all the risks that go along with untreated ADHD. So these are small increases in risk that I think are well outweighed by the benefits of treatment compared to no treatment at all. And I do want to point out something I noted last week, and that is that there was a meta-analysis published just a year ago of all research on all kinds of cardiac risk associated with ADHD medications. This meta-analysis incorporated the results of multiple studies, uh, indeed 19 studies involving almost 4 million people and it found no increase in risk. So this is a much bigger study. It, it involves individuals across a variety of countries, a variety of, of investigators as well. Uh, and so to me, this meta-analysis sort of, uh, if you will, trumps or outweighs the findings of that last study that I just talked about that took place in Sweden. But nevertheless, it's worth keeping this in mind. These drugs may not be uh, completely safe when it comes to cardiac health, but they might be linked to a very, very small risk of certain cardiovascular diseases. Okay, we just don't know that yet. I think the jury is out, uh, but this meta-analysis reassures me that there's probably not much of any risk there. And what risk there might be as identified in the Swedish study is pretty small. Okay, so let's let that go and let's move on to our next topic, which is another meta-analysis. You know how much I love these. This is a meta-analysis of research on exposure to certain parental forms of substance abuse and the risk of ADHD in the offspring of those substance users. And it goes on to review a variety of studies uh, I think at the end, let's see here, there were 86 longitudinal and retrospective studies that they reviewed, and they conclude that prenatal exposure specifically to alcohol and tobacco and having a parent with any substance use disorder, all three of those were linked to an increase in risk in ADHD in the offspring. Not necessarily other drugs, but those three factors were linked to risk. Now, Let's hold on here. It sort of starts to sound like, oh my God, if parents smoke or parents drink, it's going to increase the risk of ADHD in children. It might. However, what we've also seen in research is that parents with ADHD are more likely to use these substances, and it's not the substances that convey the risk, it's the genetic risk from the parent's ADHD to the child's ADHD. Indeed, in a couple of studies that controlled for the shared genetics between parents and children, tobacco exposure was found not to be linked at all to risk. It was simply a marker that the parent themselves, who was smoking during pregnancy, had also a high risk of being ADHD. The tobacco was simply a marker for adult ADHD, and that could be true of these other substances here as well. So keep in mind, we often talk here about the need for genetically informed research studies where we're controlling for the genetic transmission of the disorder when we look at other risk factors that might convey risk for ADHD in children, in the offspring of these parents. But uh, a very nice meta-analysis that simply echoes the findings of many earlier research studies that parental substance use of certain types 
is linked to risk for ADHD in children. Whether that's a causal risk or not, we simply don't know at this point without doing more genetically informed designs. Okay, last study up. This is a study on the risk of attention deficit disorder in young children who were exposed to pediatric anesthesia for various forms of surgery. Again, this is a meta-analysis. You know how I like to pick those because they give us a lot more robust findings from more rigorous studies where we combine all of the research findings into the analysis. And this study, which was published over in the journal Pediatrics and Child Health, did show once again, as we've talked about before, a small but significant link between the number of exposures to anesthesia during childhood and risk for having ADHD in childhood. Again, let's not rush to judgment. These are correlational findings. They don't necessarily mean that anesthesia causes ADHD. They could, but an equally, I think, rational interpretation here is we know that ADHD children are more prone to accidental injuries of all kinds. As a result, they're more prone to hospitalizations, and as a result, they're more prone to having to undergo surgery for their various risk-taking misadventures that lead to injury. So it could just be here that all we're seeing is that anesthesia needed in childhood is a marker for a child being at risk for ADHD anyway. The anesthesia is not the cause, it's a marker for risk for ADHD in that child. Kids with ADHD have more injuries, are therefore gonna have more surgeries, are therefore gonna be exposed to anesthesia more often. It's not the anesthesia that's doing this. Could be, though, so we need more research. It's going to be hard to disentangle this. We can't do a randomized trial where kids get anesthesia or don't get anesthesia for surgery, God forbid, and then look at their long-term course when it comes to subsequent risk for ADHD. So the study we need to do, which is a randomized trial with anesthesia, really can't be done for ethical reasons. So this is kind of the best we have at the moment, but again, it could, could be interpreted either of two ways. So keep that in mind. As I often say here, correlation is not causation, just means that two things are related. We need to further explore why they might be related to each other. Okay, thanks for joining me this week. Uh, I hope you found this informative. Once again, if you're not a subscriber, please consider subscribing to this channel. If you know others who might be interested, refer this channel on to them. Perhaps they'll find it to be valuable as well. Look forward to seeing you here next week for another video on the research published that week on ADHD. Thanks for joining me, everybody, and be well.